I believe at this point in your lives, when you're working so hard on the things that you want to become, that it's important to remember the larger picture of what you're becoming. You're getting an education which is terrific and fundamentally important. And in this world, you can't really get too much education. So get all the education you can get, possibly. That's, that's a very important principle and will become more important as the world goes on. The world has very little patience for people who are not educated these days, at least economically. But there is a larger sense of edu to education that I'd like to call to your attention and do so sharing some experiences that have been meaningful to me and I hope they'll be helpful to you. I start with a scripture which I'll use as a as a springboard for, uh, for my remarks. This is one which is taken out of context. The context doesn't really fit the use I'll give to this verse, but the verse will be familiar to you from Luke chapter 14. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? That expression that the Savior gave to building a tower was used for other purposes. But with respect to where you are and what you're doing and what you hope to become and the long life that is out in front of you, a long and happy opportunity to build a great life, I'd invite you to consider thoughts about counting the cost and th thoughts about uh, ensuring that your life is complete and that uh, it complete in the rounded sense, complete in the fulfilling sense, and that in the long run, you'll be pleased with what you did with your life, with how you lived and with where it took you. Let me then suggest a couple of thoughts. One experience that I've never forgotten, it seem, seems very insignificant today, but years ago, Kathy and I lived in Sacramento, California. We lived out on the east side of Sacramento, just north of a freeway, called Highway 50. It was the freeway from Sacramento to South Lake Tahoe. We would travel that freeway now and then going out east for one reason or another. And not long after we moved there, on the south side of the freeway, someone began to build a building. I don't really know what the building was destined to become. And the reason I don't know that is along the way, construction stopped. And it was never started again. There was this uh, skeleton of a building, maybe a little more than a skeleton. It wasn't just the framing. It was it, a lot of the work was done, but it just froze. And every time we drove by that, I thought about that scripture, which, what man among you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first to count the cost. I don't know what the problem was. I wondered if it was an economic uh, problem or if there was some other issue that arose. I don't know what stopped it. I thought how terrible it was for that building to not be completed. I've since seen that there was a much larger message in that, and that is how terrible it is for a life not to accomplish all the good, all the wonder, all of the beauty that heaven intends it to accomplish. Heaven wants you and wants me and wants all of us to have satisfying, noble, uplifting, joyful, happy lives. And I've learned as I've watched over a lifetime that there are paths that lead to those destinations of happiness and joy and fulfillment, and satisfaction, usefulness, and purpose, and so many other roads that lead other places. And that building on the side of Highway 50 for me is etched forever in my mind. In fact, the last time we were there, or maybe I was there, I'm not sure Kathy was with me, I actually drove out years later. We were in law school there 40 years ago. I drove out to see if it was still there. Well, you'd be glad to know that it's not. Uh, the city reached that part of East Sacramento and the, whatever it was that was going to be there is no longer there. Well, you have so much of promise. You have so much potential. You have so much capacity to become something in this life. I'm not talking about becoming rich or famous. I'm talking about becoming a person of substance, a person of worth, a person who is dependable, who is trustworthy, a person who is capable, a person to whom responsibility can be given without fear, a person in whom another person, a husband or a wife or other people, children, 
can trust without reservation. I'm talking about the kind of person who is comfortable in any society and in any group and among any, any group of people. People of substance, people who have made something of themselves through righteous living develop an interior sense of well-being and an interior sense of, uh, an internal sense of composure and of grace that other people who choose other paths don't enjoy. They may enjoy other things, but they don't enjoy the things that most ennoble a life. With that in, in uh, mind, let me invite you then to consider some things that will help you build lives that will be useful to you. Uh, this morning in the meeting, the, the seven presidents of the 70 attend the meeting of the Quorum of the Twelve, almost all of the meeting, every Tuesday morning. And we just, I just walked out of that meeting when I came over here. One of the members of the Twelve talking about a, a uh, matter that will come uh, for final decision before long, said, well, the concrete is still wet for this idea. And that's what I'm talking about. You're young. It would be very hard for me to go back in life and decide I'm going to be a doctor or I'm going to be a civil engineer. I'm a little too old for that. It's a little too late for me to do a lot of things. But for you, almost all of you who are here, your concrete's still wet. But the concrete will cure. It will harden over time. It will harden as life goes on. So think carefully. Let me tell you a couple of stories then that uh, make this thought clear. When we lived in Buenos Aires, there was a friend there, a member of the church, who had a company that built sailboats, large sailboats, yachts, beautiful yachts. And occasionally, he would take us out on the Rio de la Plata, the river that separates Uruguay to the north at that point from Argentina to the south, and we go sailing for the day. He used to race sailboats from Buenos Aires straight east toward Africa, but of course, Africa is all the way across the ocean. It sailed down this big river. It was 20 miles wide at that part of the river. And down at the mouth of the river, where the river uh, flows into the Atlantic Ocean, it's 200 miles wide. The race was from Buenos Aires to a place called Punta del Este, Eastern Point, Uruguay. Because the river is so wide and because there is absolutely no elevation there, everything is flat, if you're in the middle of the river, you can't see the sides of the river once you get down a little, downstream a little and, and uh, closer to the Atlantic Ocean. He explained how carefully he had to steer that boat by the compass. He said, if you're only off by a degree or two, you may pass by Ciudad del Este, pardon me, Punta del Este, without seeing it. And where's the next stop? Africa. So he said, we learn to keep our eyes on that compass because an error of just one or two degrees can make a huge difference. President Uchtdorf, Elder Uchtdorf now, spoke about that same concept with respect to a tourist airplane that left New Zealand to fly to, uh, to us to Antarctica, uh, only to learn, sadly, that their avionics, their systems for, for steering the aircraft were out of kilter. They learned that when the plane crashed into a mountain because they'd just been off for a degree or two for hundreds and hundreds of miles. Well, in that sense, President Nelson, in his press conference and in his first remarks to the church upon be, being announced as the president of the church, reminded us to keep on the covenant path. Do you remember that? He said it several times. One time, I believe he said, stay on the covenant path, and he corrected himself and went back to keep on the covenant path. There is safety in the covenant path or on the covenant path. Let me take you then to a scripture that helps explain that concept. Uh, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way which leadeth to destruction. And many there be who go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Those who venture off the straight and narrow path by even a degree or two over a period of a lifetime will find that the separation that that degree or two has caused in their lives between the straight and narrow path 
and where they ended up has taken them to destinations that they didn't want to reach. It's so easy to just allow a little bit of room off the edge. My first mission president, I had two, my first mission president used to say to us, don't be tape measure Mormons. And it was a really clever way of saying, don't measure the straight and narrow path to find out how wide it is so you, have, you know how much you can get away with. He said, look for the straight, look for the center of the straight and narrow path because that's where safety is. Uh, with respect to, uh, to these concepts, uh, let me take you then to two or three other quick thoughts. This is one, another experience from South America that was tremendously uh, meaningful to me. And Kathy's heard me share this all over the world. It was one of the most instructive experiences I've ever had. We arrived in Argentina in August of 2002, and there was an economic collapse. In December of 2001, Argentina had four national presidents in 10 days. The value of the peso had gone from one to one with the dollar to one to four. So if you had a dollar bill, uh, you were lucky because you could buy a lot more things. But if you had pesos, your capacity to purchase things in the marketplace was greatly diminished. People weren't allowed to take money out of banks, and it was hard to find an ATM to get cash. Well, in that circumstance, I was asked to go up to, to Paraguay, which is a, the country to the north of Argentina. It uh, is a much smaller co country geographically and economically and by population. When Argentina became so sick with its economic malady, Paraguay, which depended on Argentina for almost everything, became sicker still. I'd only been in Argentina two weeks. I had not been in South America since 1971 when I finished my mission. So more than 30 years later, I didn't know anything about Paraguay. Never been there before. I met with the six state presidents in Asuncion and asked them to tell me all the good things that were happening in their stakes. I didn't want to talk about the problems. I thought, I don't have the answers to those questions. I haven't been here long enough to have any advice for you, brethren, so just tell me all the good things. The first one did and told me a couple of problems. And as they went around the semicircle in front of me, by the time we got to the last stake president, he'd completely forgotten the question with the help of the others who'd been in his, who preceded him and just listed all these serious problems. And I was kicking myself mentally. Way to go, Brother Clayton, is basically what I said to myself. They've listed for you, they've, they've recited these very serious problems that the people of their stakes are facing in this time of economic turmoil and collapse and, and desperation. You don't have any advice for them. What are you going to do? And as I had that thought just, just uh, front and center in my head, a question came into my mind as a fully framed question. Elder Clayton asked them this question. Presidents, for the people in your stakes who pay a full tithing, who pay a generous fast offering, who hold family home evening, who, who read the scriptures as a family, who magnify their callings, and who go out and honestly serve as a visiting teacher or a home teacher every single month. For that group of people in your stakes, President, how many people are there who have problems in today's world in, our, in uh, Paraguay that they can't solve? And the state, I, so I asked the question. I said, Presidents, for the people in your stakes who pay a full tithing, who pay a generous fast offering, who magnify their calling, who are diligent, faithful home teachers, who hold family home evening and family prayer, for that group of people in your stakes, how many people are there that can't address and resolve the problems that they're facing on their own without the church having to step in and solve the problems for them? And the stake presidents, in, as a, as a, in a single motion, looked up to me with surprise. What did they say? They said, well, none. All the people who do those things are doing fine. You get the message? All the people who do those things are doing fine. This isn't rocket science, brothers and sisters. 
It's called the center of the straight and narrow path. It's called don't be a tape measure Mormon. Don't wander off the path. Safety is found in the center. As you build your lives, you'd want to have another experience recounted to you that I had some years ago practicing law in Southern California. I had a case that took me to San Diego. We lived in Irvine, which is midway, not quite midway between Los Angeles and San Diego. And I drove nearly every day for almost half a year to San Diego because of a case that I was handling down there. And as I was driving, the temple was being constructed. The San Diego temple, it's right on the side of the freeway. Uh, as I watched, and I've been watching it along the way, but as I watched, I noticed something very interesting. Uh, and you'd be interested, by the way, it's so close to the freeway with the, the Time magazine years ago that it said it was evidence that the LDS church didn't understand the, diff the, the need to separate church and interstate. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a beautiful temple. If you go to San Diego today and you listen to the traffic report, since it's right by the freeway, the, tra the traffic reporters will say it's 10 minutes from downtown to the temple and it's 15 minutes from the temple to Carlsbad, yeah, that kind of thing. It is a monument. Everyone knows where it is. I watched as the land was cleared, as they brought in heavy equipment and they pulled with, with earth moving equipment, they pulled all the brush off, they leveled the land, they, they prepared the land for the building of the temple. I watched as the, each day as I drive by and look at this site, and drive by in the afternoon on the way home, I, as they dug the holes for the footings and for the utilities. And when, I watched as they poured concrete and then put the steel superstructure up. I watched as they began to, to put the floors in for the various floors of the temple, poured the lightweight concrete that made those floors. I watched as the rest of the utilities went into the, into the building and. And then when they put the exterior cladding on the outside so that it looked like a temple. I watched as uh, they then began to do more work with the land and bring in the landscaping. I watched when they put the, the uh, statue of the angel Moroni on the top of the building. It was, a, it was a day, by the way, that the traffic slowed. Until then, traffic kind of went by. But that afternoon on the way back, the traffic slowed. And it wasn't because of, a, of an accident ahead. It was because everybody was seeing the temple with new eyes, with the angel Moroni statue on the top. That experience reminded me or taught me of some, of some valuable concepts about building lives. Heaven starts with the basic commandments that level the land, that clear away the brush from our lives, that clear away the things that are obstacles. And then heaven starts by laying a solid foundation by putting within us a steel superstructure of commandments and of faith on which other things can then be added. Ultimately, the most important things in a temple are those things that are inside it. And that's true also with the, even with the decor of a temple. If you go to the temple, you'll note that there are messages being taught by the level of decor in various places, ending, of course, in the celestial room. When you look at a temple, you see a metaphor for the building of our lives and for helping, for the way that God helps us to become something. He starts with the basics and moves on to the finest refinements of the inner soul when we're ready for that. When we think about building lives, we, th we think about keeping the commandments of God. People who keep the commandments of God don't need to be rescued from the, uh, from the ill effects of poor choices. They don't make those choices. People who keep the commandments of God find an inner strength because God helps put it there. People who keep the commandments of God find an interior embellishment, an internal embellishment, an internal uh, an internal uh, design work almost that makes people who have kept the commandments over years beautiful people. I have learned that that's something that almost all of us can see in other people. We can tell a church member from afar in an airport. You've probably had that experience. We have it all the time. We'll see someone and say, that's a church member. 
someone will walk by us on an airplane and I'll think, that was a church member that went by. It becomes obvious over time. Let me take you to one or two additional thoughts and uh, then I'll close. This verse from the Book of Mormon, which is uh, repeated in almost the same lang language all the way through the Book of Mormon, uh, is not taken out of context, I think, at all, but sometimes I think it's misunderstood. In uh, various places we find this phrase, For the Lord God hath, hath said that, Inasmuch as ye shall keep my commandments, ye shall prosper in the land. And inasmuch as you will not keep my commandments, you shall be cut off from my presence. I don't believe that prosper in the land means a Mercedes Benz in every driveway. I do believe that those who keep the commandments of God prosper in all the ways that matter most. I don't think the Lord cares if we have a Mercedes Benz. It has little sympathy for those who think that that's something they've just got to have. Nothing wrong with it, but when we start judging our self-worth by the name in the back of our shirt or the car that we drive or the neighborhood we live in, we have failed to become people of real substance. Again, there's nothing wrong with those things. They're, they are good things and they, are, they can be very, very appropriate in lots of circumstances. It's when they are the way we see ourselves, when they become the way we judge ourselves as to how valuable we are as a person that we have become, uh, that we have gotten off the track. When we prosper in the land, we prosper because God has blessed us with peace of conscience, with revelation and inspiration when they are needed, with a family which is happy and intact. When we prosper in the land, we prosper because we've become dependable, both for the Lord and other people. Husbands trust wives, wives trust husbands, parents, children are confident in the goodness of their parents and are not deceived. When we prosper in the land, the Lord can look upon us with, uh, with kindness always, but with expectation that we will be something that He can use wherever He sends us and whatever our position in life may be. I want to bear you testimony that God blesses that God expects you to become people of substance, people of value, people of worth, people who can be trusted, people to whom he can give the kingdom and much responsibility for bearing it off. He needs you to raise righteous children, to have happy marriages, to be the light for the world. He needs you to be everything that God wants you to be, not because it will bless him so much, although it is his work and his glory to bring to pass eternal life, but because he loves you and wants you to experience the joy that comes from a lifetime of good choices that flow into wonderful consequences. I bear testimony that God lives. I know he lives, that Jesus Christ is his holy and resurrected son that this church is his church. It is the only true and living church on the face of the earth. It is the only church that has within its ranks those who hold the priesthood of God and are authorized to use it. I bear testimony of its prophetic trajectory. It will accomplish all that the Lord has said it will and it will do it because there are wonderful people inside it who keep the commandments and serve God with all their heart, mind, and soul. I bear this testimony to you and express love to you and gratitude for all that you're doing. And uh, 
in becoming people of substance and worth. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you for joining us for devotional here at Enzyme College today. We encourage you to share your thoughts and comments and also to share this link with someone who might benefit from the message. Here at Enzyme College, we believe that God can help us grow both spiritually and professionally. And we offer programs like accounting, social media marketing, medical assisting, and many more. If you would like to learn more about the programs we offer, scan the QR code on the screen or click in the link down below. And make sure to like and subscribe and join us next time for devotional.